of the show. <laughs> I don't like avoiding it, but I don't like messing with standards. I get no, that's well, right. I, you, won't, you don't want to hear what the standard is. <laughs> oh! It's, it's, a, it's, it's more like bigger than I am. No, it's fluid. No. <laughs> oh, it's fluid! <laughs> well, that's too strong. You, you, you run a Lord, we're here one more time <coughs> to lift you up on high. Lord, we want to see your face today. Amen. Let us see you as Isaiah saw you seated on the throne of high and lifted up. And Lord, then may ourselves, may we see ourselves as you see us, and may you lead us into paths of righteousness for your name's sake. That's what we do tonight, Lord. May we meet you here before in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We had a really good session. Those of you who are here for the 1.30 session, um, I finished my part and then it got really far. <laughs> the Spirit was on. It's, those of you who are here, the Spirit was on the place, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I think the Spirit was really poured out on a really special time. Very good. And uh, so anything that anything on that happens, I always give the glory to God because I'm just, right. a, I'm just a pilgrim, right? Um, anyway, let me just run a quick message for you guys. I don't think it's going to take very long. But at the end of that, if you have questions or thoughts, we'll, I like the idea of entertaining thoughts and being pleased. Uh, Ken, uh, someone's asking if you have, have a mic. We'll have shortly. Since it's being recorded, I definitely need to be on the market. It's good. Blue number four. Flashing blue light means the battery. I'm not aware. Number four. One, two, three, four. Okay, great. Last day signs standing in the last day. So what I want to do is try to tie together the first two presentations. We sort of did that already in the, in the discussion after the second presentation. But let's see what we can come up with here tonight. Again, that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. That is our objective right now is to talk about what that means. Uh, third part of the series, part one, we studied world events in general. Part two, we looked at the efforts of the beast to dominate the world and implement the Sunday law. And part three, we hope to understand what it takes to, thank you, forget it, how to, not only how to stand in the evil day, but how to lead others to it. Now this presentation is about a 45 minute presentation and I've got a stopping point at about the 20 minute point. But the thing is available on PDF, it's got two Bible studies built in it looking at our vertical relationship with God and our horizontal relationship with people. So if you want things to kind of hold you accountable to the Bible, there's some good Bible study in there, but I'm not going to get into that. Time is not allowed. Again, these are available. There's all kinds of references. Every time you see something in blue, it's a link to something else that's better than what I can say. Uh, quick review, part one. We talked about violence in the sky, we talked about digital currency, we talked about artificial intelligence, and then we thought about the process, what would happen if we married those two together? Artificial intelligence of deciding when you could use and not use your money. Uh, we talked about our form of government being broken, we talked about hate and throughout the world and in our form of government. We talked about wars and rewards, and then we talked about the gospel. A uh, quick try to look at the uh, part two, we looked at the, uh, how the Beast effort number one stated goal starting as early we, about this as about 30 years ago it was clearly stated goal and that they want to dominate the whole world they want to return to the dark ages where they have the right to destroy the heretic by whatever means is necessary to do that um, these definitely are the times that try men's souls so our outline for today. So I'm going to spend time in two books of the Bible. I'm primarily in Daniel chapter 3, so if you want to dig that up, that's where I'll spend the majority of my time. Uh, I'm going to look at the severity of the last days. Um, and uh, may have a little bit on Ellen White. And the remainder of that, the character standard for Galatians 5 and 12, those will be left as an exercise to the user. If you're here that in college. Math yeah, teacher says, and the proof is left as an exercise to the user. So anyway, very interesting here. Look at the similarities of Daniel chapter three and what we will face in the Sunday law. First of all, whose command was the first, first case? It was the command of Nebuchadnezzar and the ruler of the known world. 
papacy, it's the beast, Satan, ruler of this world, making that law. The issue is worship. The command in Daniel is to bow to an idol. Basically the same command uh, in the last days, bow to the Sunday law. Penalty for death. The action of the majority is to bow down, and the majority will worship. And standing against, in the case of Daniel, it was three out of approximately 50,000 people that were probably there at that day that stood for it. And in the last day. So we'll, we'll fresh flesh that out just a little bit here as we go through. All right. Again, I want to repeat this slide. What is Christ waiting for? All right. Uh, Lord, may the Lord give us no rest, day or night, to those who are now careless and indolent in the cause and the work of God. The end is near. This is what Jesus would have us keep ever before us, the shortness of the time. We need to be diligently studying the Word of God and striving to conform our lives to its precepts. If you love me, keep my commandments. And so we were talking about that in a little bit more detail. Um, and not only that, but Christ is waiting for us to be prepared. We know from the 1888 materials that he could not come because he did not have a people that was ready. So what I want to do, somehow the Lord has called me, and been laying this on my heart a little bit here, is to help us understand that if we keep doing what we're doing now, we ain't going to be ready. A few of you may, I know I wouldn't be. If I was where I was a year ago, I would not have been ready to pass this test. So... And we can hasten his return, something else I think I get excited about. Hastening his return, do his job. All right. So here, looking in the book of Daniel, we have a crowd of people and three guys standing alone. Let's turn to Daniel chapter 1, 3 verse 1. And we have Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. Uh, and he set it on the plain of Dura. And the king Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together all of the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So what's the purpose of the image of gold? Why did he have the image of gold set up? All right, this is feedback time. Why did he set up the image of gold? Because that was, yeah, his kingdom was gold. Yeah, but he... He, he, also, we know that his kingdom, he, he had heard from Daniel that his kingdom was going to end, right? Yeah, but so he, he didn't want that, right? So this is his in-your-face God. Yes. This is an in-your-face God kind of idol. He did not do that. God did not want him to do this, but God knew he was and knew how to make it work out for his, for his glory. All right? So why was it all gold? I just answered that question. So who all was called to worship? Well, everybody that's anybody. You know, the workers that are still out in the field, they, they can go out there. But if you're anybody. Would that include, why would that, the question is, why would that include Daniel's friends? By this time, they were older, and they had shown themselves wiser than all of the wise men. And they have been put in charge of the provinces, or provinces, the Bible says it, of, of, Dan, of uh, Babylon. Thank you. Uh, so they're all called to worship there. So let me help you understand this. 50,000 people standing around. Let me, let, me, let me kind of paint a picture. You have been invited by some quirk to a presidential gathering. And all the, the senators and the presidents, all the famous people there, and it's a sporting event. But you're, up, you're part of the presentation at the front of the sporting event. And everybody's seated up front. And they play the national anthem. And everybody in the stadium stands up, and everybody on the row with you stands up except you. Kind of get the idea? That's what these guys had to do. They had to stand alone, in the, uh, stand on principle before a large crowd of people. All right. Now, and at the time, you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony of all kinds of music. You shall fall down and worship the gold image the king Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. So, first of all, 
How many of y'all suspect that that music was probably very loud? Kind of like heavy metal? You know, it's interesting, um, quick aside, it's been shown that loud music, even classical music, numbs the prefrontal cortex of the brain and can cause a high like a beer. And so rock concerts, very loud. They've also discovered that a very heavy beat from music has a similar effect. So you combine the loud music with a heavy beat. I won't go into a church service if there's a trap set on the stage and I see somebody up near it. I won't go in. I'll turn around and walk away. What you listen to, you listen to raw music, you're giving Satan, you're numbing your brain a little bit to give Satan an edge in your brain. Now I'm going to stop, that's the point I stop preaching, sorry, dark metal. It's an old preacher joke. Preachers, old Baptist preacher standing up front and he says, now I want to talk to y'all about that. Evil's a smoking, smoking will kill you and you can't smoke it. Later in the front row says, Amen, brother, preach on. He says, I want to talk about the evils of drinking. If you drink, you will destroy your lives. And the front lady says, hey, hey, preacher, preach on. Amen, amen. And I want to talk to you about the evils of gossip. He said, wait, 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 preacher. Now you stop preaching, start admitting. I'm going to meddle. Get my drift, I may meddle tonight. All right, moving right along. Um, here's a question. Could God have prevented the test? Could God have prevented them from being in the middle of this test? Sure. Wouldn't it have been hard? Hey, send them on a business trip. I would give them all sick in bed for a day, you know? Whatever. Well, here's another question. Did they know what was, what was going to happen? Did they know what the law was and all that when they, when they went there? Did they know what was about to happen? Absolutely. Because they may. Look at the previous verse. He passed this law, passed it all around the congregation. You've got an invitation, an engraved invitation to come worship. All right? Um, but he didn't. He didn't stop the test. Why didn't he stop the test? Got a heavy thinking here. Well, what do we know? We know we've read the rest of the story, right? Well, what did he know? He knew his boys were going to make it, right? But see, he had to trust them. He had to trust them that their faith was sufficient to stand. Because at that point, he wasn't standing next to them like he was in the fiery furnace. They had to stand on principle. Okay. And it was also necessary for his plan to work that his boys stand firm on principle. And so it would bring the ire of the king because God was planning on using it. When we go through tough times, does God have a greater glory for him and for you? All right, let's get an example of something. We'll talk a little more about that first of all. Let me see here. Making sure I didn't have any more notes down there. All right, let's skip down to verse 12. And these are reports brought to by the other Chaldeans. These were the guys that uh, Daniel's three friends showed up badly after the uh, food incident in chapter 1. All right. There are certain Jews whom you said over the affairs of the province of Babylon. This is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, they have not paid due regard to you. They don't like you, man. They, 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 they are not in your court at all. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you set up. And he said, oh, cool. Uh, no, not much. See, they've been found wiser than all their peers, and they've shown them up. They're older, and they're, they're in their middle years. They're probably well set financially. They've probably got family, probably got kids at home, got a household. They may even have grandkids. Who knows about how, how long down the road this is. In worldly terms, they had it made. Was there a worldly incentive for them to bow down? Yeah. Huge. Yeah. Huge. We got it made to get paid big money. All right. They're, they're the best. God's been blessing them, by the way. Just, 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 just a little thing. It's just a little thing. You go back. We'll get back there. Anyway. So, in other words, they decided to bloom where they were planted and not stress about the things they could not change. All right? And so King Nebuchadnezzar found out about that, and he liked these boys. I mean, gosh, 
he and his friends were so, so explained the dream, and he went with the, they with Daniel, and said he liked the guy. I said, give him time, give him a second chance. He said, now, if you are ready, in the time when you hear the music, then and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you don't worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Is that in your face? In your face. That is in your face. You know? Like the end time in the Sunday law, this law now has teeth in it. All right? Death penalty for failing to worship. And it's about, a judgment is about to be executed upon the Sabbath keepers. All right? So, moving along. Shadrach, Meshach answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, that is that they were going to be thrown into the fiery furnace, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us and from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, meaning we would go into the fiery furnace, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Did the king have any questions about what they meant? Was that clearly stated? Did it raise his eye just a little bit? Yeah. So, could God have stopped this test? Yes. Certainly. Could have stopped it anywhere along the line. Could have given the king another dream, perhaps. You know, don't mess with these guys, they're mine. But he didn't. You see, God knew the final outcome. And his objective in the long term was to save the king. To save the king. He knew the final outcome. And God was there with them, standing in front of the king. He wasn't visible then. He became visible in the fiery furnace, but he was there with them. And they knew. Think about, think about, we'll talk more about it, but think about the strength of character that they had to stand up knowing that they were sacrificing their lives. So they stood, had to stand on principle. All right, so now let's hear, all right, no, we know the ends of the test, so we'll kind of keep that in mind. Who was impacted by the test and its final result? Who all had their lives changed by this test? We were thinking about the final result. <coughs> the king, for sure, right? And, he, and, and, and a few other, few of the people that were there at the, right? Us. us. Yeah. Well, us too, but I'm just thinking about it his day. There was those that were there, was a, there at the uh, dedication of the statue. There were those. Now I'm Shadrach, and I'm going after this is all over with. I've been saved in the burning furnace. Everybody in the country knows that their God saved them, and their God stood with them in the midst of the fiery furnace. So now you're at the grocery store, and you hear people whispering, "Hey, hey that's Shadrach." He's the guy that stood up to the king, and his God saved him. He stood up face to face with the king and faced him down. Hey, Shadrach, you got a few minutes. Tell me about your God. Tell me about your God. See the application today? If we take a stand, we may have to stand alone. But, think about this. Have you ever been in a situation where you had to take a stand? Or somebody had to take a stand. Doesn't it become easier for someone else to take a stand with them? You follow my logic? You see, courage is contagious. Courage is contagious. So we may have to take a stand in the last days, and there are going to be people watching. As a matter of fact, I promise you they'll be watching, and that's the one of the reasons that you are undergoing the test at whatever instant that might happen to be. Does that make sense? All right. Unfortunately, cowardice is also contagious. Now, this content right here, most of this comes from uh, uh, Jake Cameron in a sermon. He sent me a copy that he did uh, called The Power of No. If you want to see that video, I can send you links. Great video. It has this content in it. So, like Job, for example, though they slay me, yet will I serve him. Yeah. 
All right, so the question is, how do they get to this point? What preceded their strength at this point in time? So let's take a, let's kind of jump to the heart of the matter. Where did they get this faith? Were they great men always? Probably not. But remember now that these were the intelligentsia of Israel. They were all probably educated. They probably all had the Torah memorized. So they were, they were, they were schooled. They were schooled before they were taken because they were the best. Uh, so let's look at chapter 1 real quick to kind of get us an answer here. All right. Daniel and his three friends purposed in their hearts that they would not defile themselves with the portion of the king's delicacies. Therefore, they requested that they might not defile themselves. Now, Arioch, the king's steward there, implied that it was possibly a serious matter, that he might lose his life for it. But from them standpoint, do you think that was a huge test? Hey, just eat some shrimp, man. I got some great pork chops. I marinate them in beer and put them on charcoal grill. By the way, I used to do that. Except the beer part. But that's not a big test. By this point in time, they were still already people of character. Right? They had learned by this point in time to follow the Lord in all things. So my question to you here is a very serious question. I want you to think about this. If they had been in the habit of making small compromises with sin, nobody will know I'll watch this thing on TV. And nobody's going to know what I'm watching. Not really dirty, but you know, a little bit of foul language and kind of sacrilegious, but it's funny, so I'll, I'll go ahead and watch it. If they'd had that kind of a habit, would they have been able to survive this test? Not a chance. You see, one of the most dangerous things in our life are small sins that we choose, we choose to repeat. What is that? If we choose to repeat, what is that? That it says the sin of witchcraft. That is rebellion. Small sins in your life may be huge sins if you know them and you haven't confessed them or haven't let them go. I don't know what's going on in your life. All right. I've had my battles. I ain't got victory over it, but I'm certainly a long way from where I was. So I understand that. Uh, you see, their life had to be a pattern of absolute, total commitment. Every moment of every day, every decision, if you love me, keep my commandments. Their life is a pattern. Yet they were able to stand bold. They had made an irrevocable decision that no matter what happens, they're going to follow the Lord. So even as youths, I suspect that they had been following the Lord in everything. They had made it a habit. Let's talk for three seconds about habit. How much time do I got left? About ten more minutes, maybe? How much time do I have to be done? Seven o'clock. Oh, I'm going to use that all that. People will be sitting on this, looking at their watches. I get that. Let's talk about habits. They say it takes approximately three weeks to establish a new habit. If you want to get rid of an old habit, what's the easiest way to do it? Replace it with something good. Okay? That's how I quit smoking. And I, wasn't, I didn't replace something quite good, but I put a pack of chewing gum. We used to have these big fat packs of chewing gum, about the same size as cigarette. I reached in for a cigarette. I grabbed a stick of chewing gum. Probably ruined my teeth, but I got rid of cigarettes back when I was 20. You know, replace it with something good. Well, what's the good we want to replace this with? We want to replace it with a constant little, little obediences to the Lord. Get in a habit. Of, of, and the thing is, you see, sin occurs twice. I'm mad living now. Sin occurs twice. Once in the mind and then in the actions, right? They have shown through, through electrocardiograms or electrocephalograms or whatever it is, that the greatest high occurs at the decision point to sin. Isn't that something? The high occurs at the decision point of the sin. And you see, we win the victory when we begin to recognize. Here's the thing. When you have when you sin, when you make a mistake, what's the old saying? Learn from your mistakes. Go back and review how you got to where you are. Was it a particular environment? Was it a particular group of friends? 
Was it, was it something going on, something around you? When you recognize that, alarm bells should go on in your mind. When Satan speaks that lie and you think about it, he's got you. You see that pretty woman, you want to look. Guys, I'm talking to you. Okay? I find myself, I've learned to look at the ground. See something that's pretty coming or whatever the outfit they shouldn't be wearing. You know, but you confront the lie as soon as it happens. So you confront it. And that becomes a habit. If you will do that for a month or two, it'll get easier. And it'll become a habit. and become a eternal life-saving habit. You all know, follow me so far? And left him by in the dirt. All right. Remember, if you fail the small test, you'll fail the big one. So there's a quick analysis back on this. Uh, it's a perfect match to what we're going to face. We can learn from our mistakes here. We can learn from what they did. And when the implication is very clear. We have to develop characters capable of standing in the last days. We have to clean up our lives. And we can't do that alone. Amen. All right. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. At the end of the story of the Laodiceans. All right. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. And when you do that, he's going to bring all the angels as part of heavenly cleanup crew. And he's going to say, well, you open this closet and you go, ooh. Okay, I'll let you get in that closet. How about this room? Can we go, ooh, okay. So he's right throwing all the doors open. You clean up. Let me give you a kind of an example. This is kind of interesting. My sister used to live on the island of Roatan, and they have a ants that show up at the door, massive amounts of ants. People throw the door open to them. They come in, and they clean the place up. They take everything out, and they get rid of all the bugs and all the trash and food on the floor and everything, and they clean it all up, and then they leave. They're not dangerous at all. Well, when my uh, wife and I went... So we got down there. She had the house sprayed three times because Gloria's not real fond of bugs, to put it as mildly as I know how. Ah, there's a bug! No, not quite that bad. But anyway, we got there. The uh, scouts, two or three of the scouts of the ants came in the house. They wandered around for about 10 minutes and turned and walked back out the front door. That's what God wants to do to our lives. He wants to bring an army into your house into your soul and clean up everything that's in there. And when he does, I promise you great joy and great peace. I ain't there. I'm preaching to myself, by the way. This is the path upon which I have begun to tread. All right. Here's the scripture. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust in what also is much. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you the trust of great riches, like eternal life? If you've not been faithful in who is and what is another's, who will give you what is your own? All right? These are men of integrity. They were about to lose everything. Their character stood strong. They had made a habit of doing what the Lord required. Just making sure I don't have any more. this out so I don't have to screw up. All right. The habit of following God must be developed in small ways. Righteous living, righteous thinking. Let nothing, let, what did uh, David say? I will let no evil thing into, into my mind. How does he say it? I can't remember. You know the words. Um, so by, by right now, for cer I'm certain that just about everyone in here has sins in their life that we're either not aware of or we've failed to repent and confess them. So here's a challenge for you. <clears throat> when you say, when you invite the Lord in, say, Lord, help me see my...